quite the group. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Zach Fowler. I'm one of the OWAP Omaha co-leaders. Uh, we've got John and uh, Rob here as well. Did... Okay. Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, Michael Bourne is going to be talking today about mobile app security assessments. And I just wanted to give just a few minutes before he gets started to run through a couple of quickies. Um, at the start of our chapter meetings, uh, we picked this up from some other chapters. We thought we would share any job announcements. If anybody has any job announcements that they wanted to share and put out there, this would be a good place to do that, just as a hello. John, you sent me one yesterday. I do. I'll bring it up here and keep on talking in a moment. Not really a whole lot to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so first off, I, I do know that um, TD Ameritrade um, is going to be looking for uh, security assurance folks that will be um, doing application security, working with the development teams. Um, and so you can either talk to me or Scott Christensen on the OLA site. So I know that that one's for a fact. And if I get this up, I have another um, opportunity that is um, a position. It's a web developer position down at Stratcom, Booz Allen. And um, it's looking for a uh, .NET developer okay. um, to work on the team that they're putting together. Um, Michael DiAfonso from our InfraGuard world uh, is our contact. But you can start with me on that one, and I can forward your name on to Michael. So it's a .NET ASP <coughs> developer. So, there we go. So the couple, John has a couple opportunities. Anybody else have any that they know of that they want to share? Um, so my name is Joshua Pugate, Chris Position at Stratcom. They're probably looking at filling this next spring May timeline. Okay. Um, graduates of the UNO programs. Okay. Yeah. I mean, specific candidates, uh, probably more of a systems engineering type position, not necessarily not a spot. But uh, uh, it's I find a very big deal for especially new grads and people that and there's a, a significant ten to twenty thousand dollar I think federal loan repayment type of stuff. That, nice. Um, and then if they're sending them scholarships where they need to fulfill government service for the scholarship. Um, and counts really bad as well, too, so uh, see me. Excellent. All right. So we figured uh, at the beginning of our chapter meetings, but so far we've been doing about quarterly. We just have a couple minutes to share some job announcements. If you guys are interested or know somebody, catch with these two afterwards and get some connections. Yes, sir. <coughs> Hi, Matt. Hi. Uh, can I have one awesome? Sure. Should I just say it? Yeah. Okay. No, it's not too late. Uh, I'm Matt Heller. I work for uh, San Francisco State Fiso. Uh, we're looking to hire about seven engineers by February. Uh, junior, mid-level, uh, we're kind of a JDM shop. We do a lot of EMR, plastic properties, and talk about services. Um, so that would be a lot of fun. So many years. Cool. All right, thanks, guys. Um, if you haven't got involved with OWASP, this year we started up the Omaha chapter again, and we are sort of given a reboot. If you become a member, then we get money that helps pay for events like this, or uh, venue pricing, or also some OWASP swag. Unfortunately, we ordered it too late to actually make it here for the meeting, so look for that in spring. Uh, member benefits, you get some discounts to OWASP conferences, 25% off of Black Hat meetings. You can get an OWASP.org email address. Woohoo! Yeah. Um, and then also you can vote in the elections if you'd like to do that kind of stuff. Right, OWASP is very big about being transparent. Right now, we have $358 in the Omaha Chapter Bank. So we use that uh, between the five co-leaders. Uh, we use that to, you know, if we need to pay for like the coffee shop we did last time. ICT is hosting us for free today uh, and supplying the pizza, so that's awesome. But uh, that's where that money goes to, and we'll be transparent as we can about where we spend it. If you are interested in being a member, just search for OAuth membership, and it takes you to the main wiki, and you can sign up there. And you specify which chapter you want to give the the percentage to. Uh, Omaha would be a really good chapter to choose, although you could probably choose another one if you wanted to. Um, so these are the main principles of OWASP. I don't need to hit them in detail, but here they are. If you believe in these things, then you believe in what OWASP is trying to promote. So really big with being open, free, sharing what security is all about to the developer world and others. Um, so this is kind of the short version of a mission statement. Uh, read, they have resources online. Some of you may be familiar with them. But more specifically, we have resources. Um, our mailing list is our main communication point. So if you haven't, if you go to the, and search for OWASP Omaha, you can get on our wiki page, which has a link to sign up for the mailing list. And that's where I send out all these like meeting announcements with increasing frequency as we get closer to the meetings. Um, also, we're on Twitter. But yeah, if you want to Twitter, that's fine. It's there if you want to sign up. 
Uh, or you can contact me, Zach.Fowler. You know I'm a member. Uh, at OWASP.org. With that, thank you to UNO ISNT. I work here, full disclosure, so it needs for me to get some space here. Uh, we have a information assurance master's program that just got stood up recently. Uh, Steve and Abhishek are here. And Robin, if you have any questions about maybe coming back and getting some IA degrees, perhaps, more than one, or several degrees at UNO, we'd love that, of course. Uh, but they can answer questions about the programs. And I've got a couple flyers on the back if you want to even sign up for just a class or two. Um, Abhishek does vulnerability discovery classes. Steve does everything. And Robin does everything as well. We've got some really good professors and really good students and really good facilities if you wanted to come back and get some education and pitch. With that, Michael Bourne is here to, prevent, to present from Solutionary. Uh, he's going to be showing us uh, some mobile app security assessment stuff. Maybe you saw the video we posted before this. It's still out on our YouTube channel, which is basically a setup uh, that he's going to be using today. Um, we are attempting to broadcast this live, uh, and I just sent a link out to the mailing list, so I'm going to go check it out in the hallway and make sure the sound is coming through. So if you ever can make it to a meeting, we'll, we'll try to do these live online as well each time. When we're done, i got a simple feedback form. If you don't mind, let us know how it went. I would appreciate it. With that, Mr. Warren. I can attest to the, uh, the graduate program for the uh, information assurance. Uh, here I attended for one semester before it was a little rough on my marriage and I had to drop out. <laughs> it's a good program though. Uh, very, very good professors. Good, good program. Uh, my name is Michael Bourne. Let me just switch this PowerPoint real quick and uh, we'll get started here. How's everybody doing today? A little cold outside? I'm battling a cold. I know not ideal for a presenter, so I apologize if I if I hack up along uh, during the presentation, I'll do my best not to. Brought plenty of liquids to, to keep my throat uh, moist. But uh, I'm a uh, associate security consultant at Solutionary. I see some Solutionary folks represented here. Go ahead, raise your hand if you work at Solutionary. Woohoo! All right, thanks for the support, guys. Uh, we are a, a managed uh, security services provider right here in Omaha. Uh, we are explosively growing. We are also hiring like mad for all sorts of technical and non-technical positions. Uh, we, we heavily rely on our Java developers, like Mr. Brad Rice over here and others. <laughs> I have to toot Brad's horn because I stole them from ACI. So uh, um, we also, uh, our big product is our Active Guard appliance. It's a cloud security product and a log uh, sucker upper is what I like to call it. So we, we suck in logs from uh, pretty much any device that we support, which is a pretty extensive list, too long for me to list. And then we spit it through our Active Guard engine, and we provide a, a, an alert and warning system for our clients uh, based on attack signatures that are found in, in logging. So and that's what we're known for. I work in the consulting group where we do all sorts of security assessments, external, internal pen tests, application security assessments, mobile application security assessments. I'm one of our uh, in-house SMEs or subject matter experts on mobile application security. And so uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. Now it's funny, if you were to talk to my non-technical family uh, about what I do, uh, this is their idea. Uh, they, they pretty much see me as Neo from the Matrix, and, and as uh, anybody in the security industry knows, that's really not true. Really, we're more like Curious George. We, we want to figure out how to take a current system with the rules in place and bend the rules a little bit to, to and interrogate that system and make it do what we want to do which may have been uh, unintended originally. And so that's, uh, that's the focus for mobile application security assessments as well, not just uh, pen tests and, and uh, application assessments. So today we're going to talk about uh, setting up a lab uh, to perform these. It's, it's kind of a complex process depending on what platform there is. There are some differences in the platform as well uh, between Android and iOS. Those are going to be the uh, uh, two we'll cover. Uh, we're going to talk about the hard way, the, the manual process, not using automated tools because that's how I learned to do these. And uh, at the end in the demo, I'll cover some tools <clears throat> for automating some of the testing. Now we'll also talk about a recent, or I guess not so recent now, uh, iPhone uh, application assessment I did for one of our clients. Obviously, I'm going, not going to tell you what client it is, but I will go through that process and what I found. Um, it pretty much covered the gamut of what OWASP is trying to defend against. I'll just kind of leave that hanging out there. And we'll do a quick iPad demonstration on a jailbroken iPad 
uh, and interrogate the file system and show you, you know, what, what the inner workings are like once you actually jailbreak the device. Now, it's not illegal to jailbreak the device, but no, if you do jailbreak the device, it will void any warranty you have with Apple on that device. So uh, if, you're, if you want to do that to, to play around and set up a lab yourself, just realize use an old throwaway iPad if, if you have one of those. <clears throat> And then uh, we'll close with some final thoughts, recommendations for further reading. Uh, there's been a lot of um, uh, blog posts lately, especially on InfoSec Institute, about mobile application assessments. If you really want to get into some manual code review and into the nitty gritty uh, as well. All right, so as far as the basic lab goes, uh, we're going to start with the iPhone and iPad. Um, I say iPhone, but I, I really recommend doing it on an iPad. And if you have an iPad that has uh, cellular uh, wireless technology like a 3G iPad, that's always the best. You can get a full test um, of what the application you're assessing is, is using in terms of communication means. So uh, you have to have uh, either iOS version 6 uh, all the way up to 6.1.2 only because the jailbreaks only exist for those versions. So once you upgrade, you can't unfortunately downgrade, you probably could, just not very easily can't downgrade back to a vulnerable version of iOS. And yes, the jailbreak essentially is a hack uh, to bypass the sandbox and the security that uh, iOS is trying to have. Uh, in my particular lab, I'm using the Evasion jailbreak by the Evaders. It's a well-known um, and uh, point and click. Anybody can jailbreak with this jailbreak app. Um, uh, very easy to use. <clears throat> Once you jailbreak your, your device, it's going to install Cydia, and Cydia is uh, sort of an apt and aptitude packet manager all wrapped into one, uh, including uh, sources needed to download uh, working uh, applications or tools. In this case, you'll need OpenSSH uh, because we'll have to SSH from our testing machine into the jailbroken device, and I do recommend not using a simulator uh, only because there isn't really a good emulator out there uh, that can take care of, of this for you. So we will actually be testing the application on the device. You'll need apt or aptitude, again, available from Cydia. Uh, tree, and this is going to be important uh, later, and we'll talk about this, but we're going to need to very uh, thoroughly interrogate the file system before and after the application is installed and after we actually use the application. Strings, uh, again, a typical Linux tool. Uh, this will help pull out readable information from uh, cache files or database files, and we'll use this uh, extensively to figure out if the app is leaking any private or personal information or not storing it properly. Uh, so that's one tool. And then the diff tool, again, to compare file system snapshots, as you'll see, that'll be important. Terminal app, while not absolutely quote unquote needed, because as long as you are uh, connecting from some sort of terminal application like PuTTY or uh, Linux, uh, Kali Linux in our case, um, if you just want to do it on the device, a terminal app will be needed, but if you're actually remoting in from a, a testing box, uh, that's not necessary. What you will need, though, is the uh, proxy uh, SSL certificate, and that's to make sure that all communication to your intercepting proxy is handled properly and you don't get any network errors. Essentially, what we're going to be doing is we'll, we'll be setting up a, uh, uh, an intercepting proxy to intercept all traffic re-encrypt it, and then send it off to the web services on the other end. And that's so we get a good insight uh, into uh, what's going on in terms of the communication um, and, and looking at uh, the responses from the, the web services. <clears throat> All right, now for the Android, uh, pretty much a similar type of lab setup. Uh, I would recommend an Android tablet. Unfortunately, I don't have an Android tablet, so I've got a tiny little screen uh, that I get to use. Uh, it needs to be unlocked. <clears throat> so you can control the boot sequence. It also needs to be rooted, so you've got full super user access to the underlying operating system. Super user app is a good one and uh, well known. You also need ES File Explorer. Uh, this allows you to interrogate the file system to help you install the certificate from your intercepting proxy and manually install any apps that you need to download for testing. Uh, BusyBox installer goes right along with ES File Explorer and makes installation easy. Uh, a terminal app, again, this is optional. If you were using and doing all your testing on the device, which I don't recommend for Android, get a terminal app. Uh, otherwise, uh, use your intercepting proxy. Uh, I'm sorry, your uh, testing machine. 
Uh, along with that, you still also need to install the SSL certificate. Now, one thing I found with Android is the depending on which flavor of Android operating system you have, you have to name your uh, certificate from your intercepting proxy with a certain extension. I don't have the list with me. It's a quick Google search. Google what Android platform you're using and figure out what its uh, certificates, uh, what extension its certificates need to be easily installed. And again, you'll do that through ES File Explorer and BusyBox installer. Okay. As far as the uh, testing machine, um, we use Kali Linux, the latest and greatest in the backtrack line of uh, pen testing distributions. And within Kali Linux, you'll need some sort of intercepting proxy. Um, we happen to have a Burp Suite Pro license, which is both good and bad. It's great if the applications we're testing speak only over port 80 and port 443. It's bad if the applications don't speak over port 80 and port 443. There are other proxies out there that you can use instead. It's just a little bit more complex of a process. Mm -hmm. So for now, we use Burp Pro because we haven't encountered any apps that happen to communicate uh, over um, non-standard ports. You also need a packet sniffer. Again, this is personal preference. Wireshark or TCP dump, um, both are installed on Kali Linux if you prefer the uh, graphical-based Wireshark. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, go for it. If you prefer TCP dump, uh, use that as well, whatever your personal preference is. Uh, tree, uh, again, this is going to be specific for Android uh, assessments. Uh, there's a difference between Android and iOS, so you'll need the Linux-based tools on Kali, which it already has uh, not much extra installation. Uh, so tree diff and strings, and then other tools as needed. All right, so here's what our basic lab looks like. Uh, we've got our Kali Linux with Burp Suite Pro, and I put Wireshark, but again, you can use TCP. Don't. Intercepting all traffic from our tablets or our phones, whatever device uh, we're running the test on. Again, the bigger screen of the tablet is definitely pretty sweet on old eyes. <laughs> and then uh, all traffic's going through that, and then it's heading to the interwebs. And we all know what the interwebs are, right? Okay. Let's talk about some of the differences. On the iPhone and iPad, uh, we're going to SSH from Kali into that device. Uh, when you jailbreak an I iOS device, um, it automatically installs OpenSSH and starts a uh, SSH server. You, what you have to be careful of is the default password for the root account on those iOS devices is Alpine with a capital A. Everybody knows it, right? So the first thing you need to do is obviously change that root password. Pretty standard practice, okay? So with an iOS device, we're SSHing in, and we've got some uh, cache names and, and files that are storing cache information are pretty standard new name. You'll find cache.db, et cetera, et cetera. Android's a little bit different. Uh, in order to get all the Linux tools we need onto the Android device, you essentially have to reinstall a more robust uh, OS onto the Android device, and that kind of defeats the purpose. Okay. And it's not really easy. If we're going for streamlined testing uh, because we've got a deadline and a client needs this test done in a certain amount of time, we don't always have time to fiddle around with installing a new distribution of, of uh, Linux on the Android device. So what we'll do instead is we'll mount it locally in our Kali testing device, and that way we can run our full Linux commands on the mounted uh, um, set of directories. And what I've noticed, too, is, is that the names of cache files differ. It's really what the developer prefers. Okay. So the general assessment process is we're going to take several file system snapshots. And again, this is the hard way. This is the manual way. This is not quite using fully automated tools. We want to take a file system snapshot before the application is installed. So we can see the state of our device's directory structure before all files are, are put in by that uh, application that we're testing. We want to take another one after the application is installed, and then we want to use the diff command to compare the two. Um, I put them in a text file to compare the two, make it easier, and, and then focus on, on the, the directories and files created by that application for your testing. We also want to take another file system snapshot after we create an account on the application. And as we'll see in, in, in uh, upcoming here in the presentation, the reason why we do this is because there's going to be cache files written possibly by creating an account 
um, uh, on the application. And so we want to know what those new files are and where they're stored so that we can interrogate them with the strings command and, and really go through and find some juicy stuff. So following all the snapshots, we're going to review those file system snapshots. And again, <clears throat> we're going to do before and after application install and before and after account creation. Um, my personal preference is just to pipe the output uh, of the, the tree command when I'm looking through the file system into a text file and then just dip those two text files. Nice and easy. And then we also want to review after using the application. Uh, and again, this is going to um, reveal uh, any new files that are written post account creation once we're logged in and actually walking through the application. And throughout the entire process, we'll review our proxy logs. Uh, you'll be surprised at what you'll find in these sometimes. Um, whether it's a hard-coded password being transmitted or sensitive credit card data being transmitted, Burp will tell you if it's not encrypted. And so you definitely want to review those heavily. Um, and it, it will give you a sense, too, of what, what kind of web services technology is using on, on the back end. And then, of course, traffic review. Uh, you want to be, review Wireshark uh, after the traffic leaves Burp and is quote unquote encrypted to see if there's any plain text information that's in that stream. Okay. So, what are we looking for? Uh, you've got your OWASP top 10. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Uh, on top of that, we're looking for any plain text cache, uh, data leakage, sensitive information disclosure. Um, poorly stored uh, cache information or just information that doesn't meet compliance standards if, if a client's concerned with compliance. Um, injectable JSON or XML, and on top of that, a lot more applications have JavaScript and web languages, so really you're also looking for SQL injection and any sort of uh, uh, script injection possible, cross-site scripting, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Weak or no encryption, um, is it a finance application? Is it sending payment data over the wire and maybe the encryption process is weak, maybe it's using weak ciphers to encrypt it, maybe it's um, not encrypting it properly before it leaves, leaves the phone. Maybe it encrypts it over wireless, but to save processing power, it doesn't encrypt it over 3G. <clears throat> These are all things that, that we're looking for. Uh, on the back end, too, we always ask our clients to allow us to put the entire server in scope because we want to see if the web services are misconfigured. Okay. We want to see if we can actually gain a foothold into a client network from the web services server uh, that's running on the back end communicating with these applications. And then any hard-coded goodies, and it, it's a little more difficult doing it the manual hard way to find the hard-coded goodies because you actually have to break open the application, and uh, I'll show you uh, some tools that will do that uh, at the end here in the demo. You're also looking for weak session ID, so any typical um, web application type of vulnerabilities you would find with authentication mechanisms. Um, can I perform a session fixation attack? Because I'm intercepting that stream, can I take over somebody else's session and gain access to the application and any sense of information that the application may hold? OWASP top 10, I'm sure we're all familiar with that. <clears throat> and then platform specific vulnerabilities. iOS, it's Objective C, right? What, what vulnerabilities did the C language have with buffer overflows with uh, um, format string vulnerabilities. These are some of the things you're looking for for iOS. And with Android, you've got a lot of Java-based vulnerabilities that, that you want to look out for, too. Uh, of course, any um, web language vulnerabilities uh, as well would be tied into those uh, also. OK. So <clears throat> let me uh, <clears throat> get my voice back here. Let's uh, talk about a recent um, assessment I did. So this is for a uh, restaurant client of ours. My wife and I happen to love eating here. Like, if we can afford to eat there every single day and not weigh 400 pounds, we would do it. <clears throat> the application specifically allowed registered users to order online, pay for food online, set up all that information in the application, store that information in the application, um, including payment information, um, had really good security in terms of a security question. You know, it didn't ask you what, what your mom's maiden name was. Um, so, you know, from that standpoint, it was, it was pretty good and pretty robust. It also allowed you to manage your account, to, to add gift cards, take away gift cards, um, add credit cards, delete old credit cards, whatever. 
Um, and it would look up gift card values for you uh, for this particular restaurant. <clears throat> and this is going to be important uh, coming up later. So for the iPhone, which is the one I did, um, it was the latest production version available on the App Store. The Android version was the latest release candidate. Um, they, they were getting ready to release it. They wanted us to test it alongside the iOS version and uh, see what we could find. <clears throat> Cha ching Again, I talked about the cache and, and storing information. So uh, in the cache.db file, uh, again running the strings command, I found the fake credit card information, plain text, right in that file. Okay, this was like super exciting. I was getting really excited. Okay, what else was I going to find? Oh, look, there's my authentication session. Username, password, security question answer, and the ID for the security question. <coughs> <clears throat> and all the information for registration. My name, my address, my phone number. Uh, the credit card information, again, anything that I didn't want to see in plain text, I saw in plain text, okay? <laughs> so here's what it looked like when I ran the strings command. Uh, and again, I, all, all the parameters have been changed, but, um, you know, it, it, it gave you the name of the, the web service it was speaking to. It gave you the card number, the type, the expiration. Um, the only thing it didn't have was the little security number on the back, but so that, that was there. <clears throat> and then here's all the registration information with the security question answer, um, you know, your password, your phone number. <laughs> Again, everything you don't want to find in a PCI compliant application was there, all right? <clears throat> and I have to, you know, I have to confess something. One of the guys from the client side um, is a friend of ours. <laughs> and when I had to break the news to him, I swear I heard him crying on the other side of the line, but it's okay. <clears throat> All right, so I mentioned uh, gift cards, and um, what we did is we ran an attack against the gift card service, and the, the goal was we wanted to try to find if we can enumerate legitimate gift cards either with or without a balance out there in the wild. So what we did is we bought six gift cards. We put a dollar on all of them, and what we noticed is... Um, I'm oh, missing a slide, but that's okay. <clears throat> so um, we, we used Burp to, to try to enumerate the gift cards, and what we noticed is that there were uh, 16 digits, okay? And the first um, eight digits were the same on all the gift cards we bought, okay? So we had another employee buy some gift cards where he lived, same difference, but the eight, first eight digits were different. So we're like, okay, maybe this is a regional type of number for these gift cards, all right? So we used uh, Burp Intruder and ran a sniper attack, and because of verbose error output, we were able to uh, successfully enumerate legitimate gift cards with or without balances, okay? Because especially because we knew, <coughs> uh, we, we knew um, legitimate numbers, at least six legitimate numbers, okay? So here, here's a little setup of, of Burp uh, Suite Pro. Um, this is called the sniper attack, where you see those two little symbols. That's where the payload is going to be inserted in each request to the, the web service, okay? Um, all we had to do was come up with 16 digits and maybe change the last few. Here's the details of the attack. All right, so 16 digits, initial eight were the same. So we knew that we had a known good gift card ending in 3552. <clears throat> So all we did was we ran through Burp Sniper Attack um, a range of numbers. You know, we knew the first eight were the same, so we can leave that alone. We, we left the next four the same and just cycled through uh, the last four digits, or I should say last three digits, because we don't want to flood their web services with, you know, too much traffic. Um, and we specifically picked a range <clears throat> where our known good gift cards would, would be right smack dab in the middle, okay? So that's, that's the attack. And we were looking for the available balance. If it had a pound sign there, it was not a legitimate gift card. If it had a number there, it was a legitimate gift card activated, and that was the available balance, okay? So as we're going through this, <clears throat> um, we, we found one in that range. 3599, again, I changed all the parameters. 
<clears throat> that had a value balance of zero. So we knew it was a legitimate gift card, it just didn't have a value on it. And so if we expanded our range and maybe started um, over all last eight digits, eventually we, we could enumerate legitimate gift cards left and right, and oh, by the way, once we had that, we can go back to the application, start ordering food left and right with those legitimate gift cards, if we had ill intentions, which we don't. We're, we're ethical. <coughs> so we, we had to go back to the client. Now, now, how would you defend against this, right? We had to go back to the client. They had an, uh, um, uh, a specific security device that would allow rate limiting, okay? So, that, so basically we had to consult them and say, you know, don't allow X amount of requests per second, because then if you do, you know it's an automated request, it's not a human being. So we, we had to have them rate limit uh, how many requests they handled on their web services to prevent this from happening. Uh, another defense mechanism is to use like a iCAPTCHA or, or something like that in the application. And they've got some really slick mobile ones now available uh, that you can incorporate, uh, but that way, you know, you have to solve the CAPTCHA every time you make a request to check your balance or, or to use the gift card. And that, so that's, that's how we had to uh, consult them to, to defend against that. Okay. All right, let's do a quick demo. If I switch over, can we see? <clears throat> 